From the Hyman blog and Press Play podcast, I'm J.D. Hyman. As a black man living here in America, I am living proof that while all men were created equal, not all men are equal. We're here to dig into the American political system, explore and unearth experiences from the human condition, and be a catalyst for some higher conversations that need to be had. No matter what brought you here, I'm glad you came. Once again, my name is JD, and this is the Hyman Podcast. Chapter 1. Normal is the Watchword. History and memories and dreams are part of the human experience. It's part of the grand design. It's how we get from one stage of life to the next. There's this old Ernest Hemingway quote, and in it he says, The world breaks everyone, and afterwards, many of us are strong at the broken places. It falls in line with what is often said about bones, that broken bones actually heal stronger at the point of the fracture. Well, that's true for a time. But eventually, the once broken bone will return to the same strength it was before it was broken. No weaker, no stronger. The same can be said about people. It's both beautiful and also a flaw in our design. During tragedies, we come together, but at some point, sometimes sooner than later, we go back to our same selves, back to what we consider normal. My name is J.D. Hyman. By trade, I'm a business manager and an ethics professor. I teach my students that in the grand expanse of ethical dilemmas, we will never truly know how we'll react to a situation until we're in a situation that requires us to act. And in that moment, the moment where one decision is pit against another, that's when our character is told. That's when we become who we are. I remember where I was, for example, on September 11, 2001. I remember where I was going and what I was doing when I found out that one of my uncles had died. And I remember exactly what I was doing just before I watched a video of a man named George Floyd die. I remember, because I will never forget where I was or what I was doing the day everything changed. I created this podcast for three reasons. One, to share my perspective and to pose questions and lines of inquiry that provoke thought and engage dialogues. Two, to bring light to situations from the perspectives of other people, people whose voices have been silenced, who can't use their voice to speak their own truth. And three, to tell stories that need to be told, to have hard conversations, stories that connect us as a people and as a society. Now, it's not my desire to convince you of anything or change your mind about anything. You're capable of judging the conversations that are had here and defining your own truth. And if I impact your life along the way, well, then that's a bonus. Welcome to the Hyman Podcast. When George Floyd died, a revolution started. And for the first time, a serious conversation is being had in this country about being Black in America and how a broken system paved the way for such a tragedy to take place in the first place. Now, remember, this is my perspective, and if yours is different, I'd love to hear about it. That's what this whole podcast is all about. Now, I don't want to get too lost in the morass trying to explain myself. I just want you to know that in all of this, you have a choice. You can choose to listen or turn it off. It's up to you. But if you hang in here with me, I'll do my best to make it worth your while. So, let's go back to the beginning, when everything was, well, normal. Part one, in the not too distant past, many people have been blind to the struggles that ran rampant in our society, struggles that plagued our country for so long. Normal was going on about our lives, either oblivious or unwilling to see that struggle as it ran rampant in our society. Normal was seeing people gunned down, brutalized, or intimidated by the police. Normal was seeing or hearing about this brutalization, people being gunned down or intimidated by the police, and still yet, nothing changed. Normal was accepting that a problem existed or changing the narrative of that problem to suit the needs of the majority. Normal was only crying foul to the problems that matter to you. 
You see, when people take it upon themselves to arm themselves to the T, stroll into a public forum, and open fire, there will be a nationwide panic attack. Let's take Vegas, for example. What are the facts? Madman shoots up a concert and a parking lot. People abruptly change their Facebook photo to include a unifying frame. The hashtags are set free, and all of a sudden, we're standing with Vegas, supporting Vegas. Next, there's a call for gun control and legislation to make sure this never happens again. Let's go back further. How about the Boston Marathon bombing? We were Boston strong back then. What about Sandy Hook? We get yearly PSAs out of that one. What about the nightclub in Orlando? Or the Virginia Tech shooting? Or Columbine? We will stand up for their unrighteousness it seems, until the people crying foul are black. I've come to a few realizations. It seems when the other events occurred, white people were outraged. They were upset and rightfully so. Other white people were being killed. People who looked like them. And in those moments, it wasn't necessarily about race per se. It was about the fact that the victims looked like them. And they related to that because they felt like they could be next. They feared the things that went bump in the night and they had to make sure it never happened to them. Fast forward. As the growing number of black people killed by police continues to skyrocket at a rate three times more than that of white people, there is yet to be consensus on this issue. Black people for once chant Black Lives Matter, not in recognition of an organization, but in defiance of our unjust justice system, which has paved the way for this to happen in the first place, and as a cry to bring attention to the mechanism that leaves us fearful for our lives, just as people screamed Boston Strong or We're All Hokies, it's the same thing. And instead of changing their Facebook profiles and letting loose with the hashtags, what do some white people chant? But all lives matter. Or better yet, but blue lives matter. We'll come back to this, but for something else. As I mentioned earlier, I'm a business manager by trade. I hold a bachelor's degree in business management, a master's degree in business administration, and a doctorate degree in the applied sciences of international business. I have formal training and applied work experience in auditing, analysis, institutional effectiveness, procedural development and analysis, retention. And I say all of this to say I am an expert in determining what constitutes as an isolated issue versus a systemic issue. The thing is, you don't need any of that training or education to understand that our justice system doesn't favor minorities. You don't need to be an expert to see that chief executives and captains of industry are predominantly white. And you don't need to be an expert to see that some people really don't have the same opportunities as others. And if you still believe they do, you are part of the problem. I'm sorry if that hurts to hear, but it's the truth. As an example of our flawed justice system, let's examine two similar cases. The first is Brock Turner. You remember him, the 19-year-old white kid from the right side of the tracks. On January 18, 2015, Brock Turner was discovered by two grad students behind a dumpster raping an unconscious woman. He was arrested and released the same day after posting $150,000 bail. He was indicted on five charges, two for rape, two for felony sexual assault, and one for attempted rape. Obviously, he pled not guilty to all five charges. The victim, who remained anonymous throughout the trial, described the horror of waking up the next morning to discover what had happened, finding dry blood all over her body and pine needles in her hair. She read a 7,100-word victim impact statement out loud during the trial, which was widely published afterwards by many major news organizations. It's out there. You can find it. It's a great read. In her statement, she described how Brock Turner had taken away her voice. But we'll come back to that. The trial concluded on March 30th, 2016, with Turner being convicted on three of the five charges, felony sexual assault. Now pay attention, this is the important part. Under the California Penal Code, Section 243.4, Sentencing Guidelines for Felony Sexual Assault, 
if convicted, carries a maximum sentence of four years imprisonment. With three counts of the same charge, Brock Turner was facing 12 years in prison, but the prosecution was only asking for six years. On June 2nd, 2016, the former Stanford University student and swimmer, Brock Turner, came before Judge Aaron Persky. Judge Persky made a statement saying that Brock came from a good family and had a promising future, and with that, he sentenced Brock to six months in jail and three years of probation. Brock was remanded to the Santa Clara County Jail where he only served three months. In a very similar case, on June 23, 2013, Corey Beatty, a 19-year-old black guy and some friends of his, raped an unconscious girl in a Vanderbilt University dorm room. The four of them were charged with five counts of aggravated rape and two counts of aggravated sexual battery. In July 2016, one month after the sentencing of Brock Turner, Beatty was sentenced to 15 years in prison, and the judge described the case, as he rightfully should have, as the saddest case he had ever heard. Now, I am in no way advocating for leniency in Beatty's sentencing. He absolutely should serve 15 years in prison. But I take issue with a judge who decided that six months was a sufficient sentence for such a horrific crime. Unfortunately, to the Black community, we've seen this story all too many times. We've heard this song. Black people are sentenced unfairly and more harshly than their white counterparts. I've heard too many white people claim that the narrative is being drawn by the media and that really nothing is wrong. Well, that couldn't be further from the truth. The disparity in the justice system isn't new and to assume it is, is naive at best. But that could just be me. The other thing I want to mention, I alluded to a few times already, is about voices being silenced. Black voices in particular. Black voices have been fighting to be heard for so long, and for so long those voices have fallen on deaf ears. One of the phrases that gets tossed around all too many times is the all-famous, well, if they would just comply. How many instances of police violence have occurred to people who were complying, or people who were completely innocent, or people who were just asleep, at home, or people who followed every command given by the police. It doesn't take rocket scientists to realize that the problem is there. But the issue is so many people out there refuse to acknowledge the problem. And that is where the issue becomes something else entirely. Because then protests and riots erupt. Protests and riots don't just come out of nowhere. People are angry. The justice system has failed too many times. What did you think was going to happen? And then it becomes a matter that people are protesting. It becomes a matter that some of the protesters are rioting. Another thing we hear a lot is, not all cops are bad. Well, can't that same logic be applied to protesters? Good cops can't stand the corrupt cops. They make us all look bad. Well, can't that same logic be applied to the protesters? At what point do you stop and listen to the protesters? At what point do you recognize that people are in pain? At what point do you defer to your better angels and approach the situation with an open mind and a willingness to listen to the grievances of a burdened people? At what point does empathy matter? I personally know cops, one of which is one of my best friends. I know not all cops are bad. And you know what? I'm not the only one who feels that way. But when you apply the law differently to different people, we notice. Me, my heart is broken. But this isn't about me. This is about the countless men and women who have died because of a broken system. Because some police officers feel like their badge is more important than the color of my skin. And for me, and I only speak for me, it's not even about the cops so much as it about the gross disparity in the justice system. In the video when George Floyd was murdered, it was hard to watch. It was right there in your face, a cop deciding his badge was more important than a man's life. 
the callousness of that action, the blatancy. He just kneeled there on this man's neck, looking right into the camera, almost daring the onlookers to do something, challenging them with his superiority. When he was looking into that camera, he was looking at me. The people looking on, they screamed, they shouted. They pled with this man just as George pled for his own life. But the officer had already decided he was the judge, the jury, and now he was also the executioner. I will never understand the mentality of, if I don't kill this person, they're going to kill me first. I have always said that if I ever have children, the one thing I would never do is silence them without question. They may not be born yet, but their voices matter. My voice matters. Brock Turner's victim's voice matters. And black voices all over this country matter. And just as their voices matter, so do their lives. So when you say things like, but all lives matter and but blue lives matter, you're effectively silencing an entire race and whether rightly or wrongly, we have to stand up for those voices. We have to stand up for voices like George Floyd, who pled for his life right up until the moment he died. His voice mattered in those moments. And then there's Breonna Taylor, who never even got an opportunity to use her voice. Voices matter. Voices are more powerful than anything you can imagine. More on that when we come back. Part two. So a few weeks ago, it was announced by a group of activists in Columbia, South Carolina, that they would recreate the Million Man March, and they were going to march on the state capitol. The thing is, no one really knew how serious they were, and no one really expected that they could pull it off, especially in the time frame they were shooting for. Chief among them was the city's own mayor. They had a lot of things going against them. The weather had been problematic. There were storms sporadic in the days leading up to the event. A recent protest that resulted in police cars being set on fire left a bad taste in the police's mouth, and a rogue set of protesters who were more interested in the destructive side of things were on the loose, and here we were in the middle of a pandemic. But then, one Saturday morning, I found myself at Martin Luther King Jr. Park surrounded by hundreds of people. Most of the men were wearing two- and three-piece suits, some wore fedoras, some without. The ladies wore sundresses, and everyone seemed to be on one accord. I had my camera, and I was more interested in the looks on their faces. They were both proud and astounded. It was incredible. And then a girl revealed a painting. She was young, late teens, early 20s. She had a look of determination on her face, stoic and reserved. The painting was of George Floyd and his daughter. It was in the likeness of a video that was widely circulated in the days after his death. In the painting, Gianna, George's daughter, is sitting on his shoulders and he's wearing a hat with the same words that she uttered in this video. My daddy changed the world. Before the march started, I made my way over to the starting point and I was met with a barrage of photographers and videographers. Some from the media, others just like me, regular people who wanted to memorialize the day. And then it started. The march was marching. At first, it was hard to judge what was happening. The crowd was moving and the horde of photographers were trying to keep pace while also trying to capture the moment while also trying not to run into one another. It took some getting used to, but once we found our stride, everything seemed to fall into place. And as we got onto the main road and really into the march, that's when things began to change for me. At some point, I got caught in the moment and before I knew it, I dropped my camera into my bag, turned around, threw my fist into the air, and allowed myself to be part of that movement. As we approached the state house, I stood up on the flatbed truck, the one that led the crowd. And as the crowd marched past us, dozens of people, I stood there on the flatbed next to the girl with the painting, both our fists jutting into the heavens. And there we stood, enduring, lost in our own revelry. People looked up at us, the anguish and grief etched in their faces. The energy was unbelievable, and it was in that moment that I realized the power of voices. Why it's so important why voices can never be silenced. Voices matter. 
I left that day knowing that not only was I part of history, but I allowed my voice to be heard. If you would have asked me a few months ago even, if I would be doing any of this or saying any of this, the answer would be a resounding no. But this is where we are. This is normal now. And whether we want to believe it or not, we shouldn't be prepared for this to go away anytime soon. And to be honest, that's okay. Because this might not be what any of us picture it normal as. But like I said, normal is the watchword. My name is J.D. Hyman, and this is the Hyman Podcast. I'll see you next time. This episode of the Hyman Podcast was written and produced by myself, with additional copy editing and story editing by Emily Stacey. Kevin Aki is our brand designer, and Brian McCallman is our sound engineer. Daniel Edgington of the Rethinking Everything Podcast consulted on this episode, with additional consulting from Garrett King, Chris Farrell, and Chase Smith. The Hyman Podcast is produced in part by Press Play Podcast. Press Play is staffed by Chase Smith, our CEO and fearless leader. I'm in charge of operations and strategic planning, and Brooks May is our head of content development. To learn more about the network, sponsorships, guest appearances, or if you're interested in launching your own podcast on our network, visit us on the web at www.pressplaypodcast.com. Promotional consideration for this season of the Hyman Podcast was paid for by Blank Shell Gaming, Grant Furnace Designs, and Buds and Bloom New York. To learn more about this podcast, our mission and vision, as well as our sponsors, please visit us on the web at www.jdhyman.com.